Ever since Tesla came to town, I've started noticing a lot of electric cars on the road. It seems like even the casinos are getting on board the electric bandwagon by offering big jackpot winners new hybrid or electric cars from Nemo manufacturers. Which makes sense. Electricity is the future. But what about the old and outdated? As technology advances further, leaving behind the nostalgic era of the automobile, there are a handful of places around Reno where you can still walk down memory lane to see some of history's greatest automobiles. Today I'll guide you through some of the areas around Reno to see some great classics. And stay tuned for a sneak peek at what's to come this summer! a weekly event of gathering enthusiasts who park their cars at a local coffee joint to show off what they drive. There are a lot of cars here today. It is the first warm week after winter is officially over and many people are dusting off their cars. This is a communal social gathering and it's free to everyone. Grab a coffee and talk shop while you see some auto eye candy. My name is Ben and I drive a Fiesta ST. Uh, my car is fun. It's just something that's fun. It's uh, a car. It's not my daily driver. Um, it's a car that I just kind of fix up and play with on the evenings and weekends. And um, I come to events just to uh, see what other everybody else is building. My name's Doug, and I drive a 06 Dodge Viper, first edition, number 40 of 200. I like to see other muscle cars because I, I grew up with muscle cars when I was young. I, I had all the, the great ones that are now selling for a fortune. I was just lucky enough to get that about 11 years ago. It's my daily driver. It's the only car I got. I moved here about a year and a half ago and I, I haven't really attended too many events. Uh, I've been on my car and the stereo and, you know, it's just been a ongoing thing. I'm Dal and I drive a 2015 F4S5. I used to watch the show Day, do you know that anime? It's a B86. Yeah, I really love the car, so they don't make it anymore, so I got the GT86. This is a 2012 Volkswagen Golf R. And this car is just kind of my passion. I wanted this car before they even started making them, because my family's driven only Volkswagen since the 70s. I really go to events to just meet people. It's nice to meet people with a like-minded passion. And yeah, I mean, it's just fun. I'm Jesus. Um, I drive a 2003 uh, Mazda 3 hatch. I have it the way it is uh, to show like everybody that, you know, you can do your own thing, like to not be afraid to try something new and you know just go on with whatever you like it means a lot i put a lot of work into it um day after day i keep putting more work into it uh, trying different new things and i attend these events you know to show off your skills you know to see what what you know what really makes you as a, as a person so you know me as as a mechanic i like to work on my own cars and you know continue going forward the event takes place every Sunday, and you never know what will arrive to demand attention from onlookers. Many of the cars are from the 90s, or some well-maintained classics. But if you're looking for a bit of history, we have a few cars to show you in a rather odd place to find them. At the corner of West 1st Street and North Sierra Street, you'll find a parking center. 
but not just any parking center. This one houses some pretty rare antique vehicles, displaying glass rooms that's viewable from the street. Behind me is a 1953 Willis Arrow Ace, and the manufacturer started making these after ceasing the production of Jeeps shortly after the war. It's famous for its low silhouette and its low center of gravity, boasting good handling and a top speed of 82 miles per hour. Each floor has its own display and some information to tell you about each car. Behind me is a 1939 Mercedes-Benz Type 230 Cabriolet B. It's famous for its suspension, which boasted an excellent road handling performance. It had a 55 horsepower engine, a cruising speed of 65 miles per hour, and managed 20 miles per gallon. While we are on the subject of antique models, we know a great place to see a huge collection of some of the rarest cars around, the National Automobile Museum, which we happen to be at right now. some of the coolest cars with real historical relevance staying back even further than the Model T. And each vehicle has a plaque to give you an idea of the vehicle's historic value. Ranging from horse-drawn carriages to jet-powered fun, there is something for everyone to enjoy. Behind me is a 1921 Rolls Royce, which was often heavily customized. The more exotic the construction material, the more appeal it had to other buyers. several area specific rooms that help you see the way things were back in the day. But a recent addition to the museum was actually about space exploration and the vehicles involved in space travel. If you show up on Science Saturdays, you get to learn a great deal about NASA's future plans for exploration. There is a video on several experiments to teach you a little about NASA's hurdles they had to overcome while planning future missions to both the Moon and Mars. Check out some of what we saw! So the gateway, the gateway configuration concept is what NASA is charged with making happen. And that's what our job today is to try to explore a life support system, an ecosystem, a biosphere, and how would we create that? What are some of the components? So thinking about habitats here, and here is a picture of a 3D printed habitat. And the idea of being that you can send these robots in advance, have them build your house before you get there. That sounds like a good plan. Intelligent autonomous robots will have interchangeable roles, from battery storage to scale rovers, logistics to excavational, and even 3D printing units, all integrated with multiple cameras and sensors for navigation. They can reconfigure themselves for a multitude of purposes, ensuring prolonged usage beyond the initial build phases. The smallest configuration is the one-wheeled scout rover that uses ultrasonic scanning to analyze the Martian surface to determine the best regions for obtaining optimum regolith. The digger receives the location coordinates and then excavates the Martian soil. It then delivers the payload to the refining assemblies. Here, large chunks of Martian regolith can be processed down to a finer grain and then delivered to the melter robots in situ. They then use concentrated microwaves to melt the regular and extrude through the 3D printing nozzle. The shell is autonomously 3D printed, layer by layer, over several months by the robotic system. The video they show was incredible, as it was telling you future expectations for creating a Mars facility as well as the technology behind it. The technology NASA's developing is nothing short of science fiction, but remarkably close to being real. We already have the hydroponics developed for growing food in soilless environments, portable shelters in extreme environments, and swarm drone technology. And with all these goals being planned over the next five years, we'll really push some amazing boundaries. Yeah, pretty excited because that really gets you thinking about the possibilities. Moving on to the next part of Science Saturday, we got to have fun with an experiment. The first was to light up several open spaces while being on a budget and using limited resources. We were able to beat the budget substantially, while making it capable of powering any single light at a time. The second experiment teaches you how NASA must overcome several challenges filtering water in a closed system so that you can reuse water for drinking and various other things while in space or on Mars. When the experiments end, the learning doesn't have to. We're standing inside of the exhibit gallery area for the Nevada Space Center in Challenger Learning Center of Northern Nevada. And it's a space where people of all ages can come and learn more about space exploration technology. We're looking at focusing on cars, stars, Mars, rovers, all kinds of different technologies related to transportation, past, present, and future. You 
get to visit some of the earliest cars ever made. These vehicles were in very good condition and demonstrate how far we've come from blacksmith hammers and wooden chassis. Can you imagine that? Driving around in cars today doing 70 miles per hour on the freeway with a car made of wood? All these cars showed you a historical understanding of technology, style, and even perspective on social status. As each car had a story, you could spend an entire day reading all the information available. Listen to this. The Jaime was a 1937 aeromobile and was the only one ever built. It was made by a handful of people following the closure of the Franklin Automobile Company. Its design is heavily influenced by space travel. As you make your way through the layout of the museum, you see how the hallways that transition you from era to era look very much like a Hollywood set. You see the street sign with cars and backgrounds to get a sense of what it was like during the decade those cars were alive. Once you get to the next large room, you move forward in time to the next era of special vehicles. Many of them started showing a real change in size, shape, and function. While some vehicles were used to carry supplies or food, others were used to make emergency situations easier to handle, like this fire truck. As soon as the first car was born, so too was racing. There are many classic and modern examples of cars built for the sole purpose of going fast. Every year had some kind of exceptional example that changed something about the automotive world. This yellow sports car behind me is a 1913 Mercer Series J Type 35. These cars are famous for winning three years running the Chicago Automobile Club Trophy Race and is the champion lightweight car for many early race car drivers. And when you compare them to a more modern example, you start to see how speed has always been a drive for true enthusiasts. There is one that was so incredible to just look at I was amazed to find out that it was a world record holder at the pinnacle of its life. Check out these cool doors and that big hood. But not only that, this car is special for setting a land record of 143 miles per hour while competing in 1959's Bonneville Soft Flats Class D. These cars were all in amazing condition, and each one could actually run today if they had fluids placed back inside them. In fact, some are actually still operating during the next event I wanted to tell you about. An event that has a ton of living legends, all in one place. is Hot August Nights, a once-a-year celebration of everything that was, and hopefully still is, running. Although Hot August Nights is a business entity in itself, these shows are usually held at several casinos all at once, allowing you to bounce around town for several days to see completely different cars wherever you go. Most of these cars are privately owned, with participants just hanging around having a good time with great cars. And there's a ton of variety. Hot rods, rat rods, classic trucks, and cars. If someone fell in love with it, you'll find it here. Much of these events are centered around entertainment, and last year, they even held a drag race. We'll be covering this event starting this summer, so if you want to see more of these beautiful classics, hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you can be there with us as we show you the hottest of hot at Hot August Nights. If you're looking to get some automotive eye candy, be sure to book Cars and Coffee and the National Automobile Museum on the map. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Thanks for watching.